You aren't going to believe what they're doing now. The story I'm going to share with you today provides a glimpse of our future, and unfortunately, it looks a lot like our past. Hey guys, Britt here. Welcome to End Times Bible Prophecy, and today we're going to talk about this story from NPR. It says, a box of 200 mosquitoes did the, and I'm going to say, medicating, because I can't read that word necessarily, even though it's from the approved NPR news source, without fear of big tech censoring what I'm saying. So I'm just going to use medicating in place of that word wherever it appears. So to go on, it says, a box of 200 mosquitoes did the medicating in this malaria trial. That's not a joke. One Seattle morning, Carolina Reed sat in a room with nine other volunteers, each waiting to take part in a clinical trial for a new experimental malaria medication. <laughs> Reed's turn came. She put her arm over a cardboard box filled with 200 mosquitoes and covered with a mesh that keeps them in but still lets them bite. Literally a Chinese food takeout container is how she remembers it. Well, I doubt it literally was, but... <laughs> Leave that aside. A scientist then covered her arm with a black cloth because mosquitoes like to bite at night. Then the feeding frenzy began. My whole forearm swelled and blistered, says Reed. My family was laughing and asking, why are you subjecting yourself to this? And she didn't just do it once, she did it five times. You may be thinking, this is a joke, right? But it's not. We use the mosquitoes like they're 1,000 small flying syringes, explains University of Washington Seattle physician and scientist Dr. Sean Murphy, lead author on a paper in Science Translational Medicine released on August 24th detailing these trials. The insects deliver live malaria-causing plasmodium parasites that have been genetically modified to not get people sick. The body still makes antibodies against the weakened parasite, so it's prepared to fight the real thing. To be clear, Murphy's not planning to use mosquitoes to vaccinate millions of people. <laughs> I love the way they go. To be clear, well, okay, then why, why are we doing the trial like this? It says, mosquitoes have been used to deliver malaria medications, and I guess I already messed up and probably said that word before, but for clinical trials in the past, but it's not common. And, oh, hey, we do this stuff all the time where I come from, right? <laughs> ah, so it says, to be clear, Murphy's not planning to use mosquitoes to medicate millions of people. Mosquitoes have been used to deliver ma malaria medications for clinical trials in the past, but it's not common. He and his colleagues went this route because it's costly and time-consuming to develop a formulation of a parasite that can be delivered with a needle. The parasites mature inside mosquitoes, so at this proof-of-concept stage, as early stage trials are called, it makes sense to use them for delivery. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Uh, it's too expensive to use needles, so we're, you know, we're going to do this instead. Now, on that thought, let's take a break from the story and come over and look at this page from the National Institute's of health. And this is called the Nuremberg Code. Now, a little bit of background was the Nuremberg Code after World War II. There were trials held in the city of Nuremberg to try Nazis for crimes against humanity, for war crimes. As a result of that, what came out of that was this Nuremberg Code specifically related to medical experimentation so that we could avoid ever having these war crimes perpetrated again. And the world agreed this is, this is the standard we're going to use going forward. So here in the Nuremberg Code, number two, it says, the experiment should be such as to yield fruitful results for the good of society. Okay, eliminating malaria, definitely even reducing the amount of malaria, that is for the good of society. That's a good thing. But here it says, unprocurable by other methods or means of study. So we go back and we look at this. It says, 
well, they went this route because it's costly and time consuming. So there was another route that could be done. So why are they choosing this one, right? Why are they choosing this? You know, and again, it says to be clear, we're not planning, <laughs> right? We're not planning to, to use mosquitoes to medicate millions of people. So we just chose this way because it was cheaper, right? That's, that's what they're saying. But then we come over and I find this other story on MSN, which is based on this story from NPR. It says, scientists tricked mosquitoes into delivering medications to humans. So it says, scientists have managed to turn one of the deadliest insects into a medication delivery system. According to new reports from NPR, a clinical trial for a system meant to use mosquitoes to deliver the medications <laughs> has been underway. So is it meant to use them? The findings for the trial have been published in Science Translational Medicine. According to the paper, scientists were able to genetically modify parasites to deliver malaria medications through mosquito bites. It's an intriguing proposition to use mosquitoes to deliver medications. <laughs> it sounds horrific on paper and even more horrific when you see the photos featured. So, hmm. so I thought that that wasn't the point. They were just doing it because it costs too much. And of course, we read down, we read some of the same things about a thousand small flying syringes. It's important to realize that the scientists don't intend, <laughs> just as they didn't plan before, they don't intend to release swarms of genetically modified mosquitoes either. Instead, they want to use the mosquitoes to deliver these medications in a more controlled fashion. <laughs> because, you know, mosquitoes, swarms of mosquitoes, whether in a lab or out in public, that's very control, much more controlled than a syringe. The researchers told NPR that releasing a massive number of these mosquitoes is an intriguing proposition. So they're intrigued by it. I thought that they weren't planning. To, they're not planning to do it, to be clear, right? <laughs> to be clear, they're not planning to do it, but it is an intriguing proposition. However, doing so would raise very deep questions about medical consent and bioethics as they couldn't control who was inoculated and exposed. <laughs> Guys, I have to laugh at this stuff because it is so insane that people would participate in this. And anyway, it, we go on, we read more further down in this article, and it says, countries try to curb malaria with mosquito netting, insecticidal sprays, anti-malarial drugs, and even by releasing genetically modified mosquitoes that can't bite or lay eggs. So releasing genetically modified. So I clicked on this link and where does it bring us? Well, it takes us back to this other NPR story from 2019. And it says scientists release controversial genetically modified mosquitoes in a high security lab. Oh, okay. All right. So they're in a controlled environment, a high security lab. We don't have to worry about um, these being released out into the wild where again, we don't know what's going to happen and people can't provide consent. So it says scientists have launched a major new phase in the testing of a controversial genetically modified organism. A mosquito designed to quickly spread a genetic mutation lethal to its own species, NPR has learned. For the first time, researchers have begun large scale releases of the engineered insects into a high security laboratory in Turney, Italy. This will really be a breakthrough experiment, says Ruth Mueller, an entomologist who runs the lab. It's a historic moment. The goal is to see if the mosquitoes could eventually provide a powerful new weapon to eradicate malaria in Africa, where most cases occur. So, hmm. <laughs> so they're planning, planning to one day use the mosquitoes. Okay, it's very exciting, Mueller says. NPR was the only news organization allowed in the lab, blah, blah, blah. 
The lab was specifically built to evaluate the modified insects in as close to a natural environment as possible without the risk of releasing in them into the wild, about which there are deep concerns regarding unforeseen effects on the environment. To prevent any unforeseen effects on the environment, scientists have always tried, they're, they're really trying, <laughs> to, to keep genetically engineered organisms from spreading their mutations. But in this case, researchers want the modification to spread. So they engineered the mosquitoes to do exactly that. So again, this is a 2019 NPR article. Let's fast forward a couple of years into the future to 2021. And what do we find? Well, the CNN Health article. First ever U.S. release of genetically modified mosquitoes begins in Florida Keys. You can't make this stuff up. The first release of genetically modified mosquitoes in the U.S. began this week in the Florida Keys. And here, here, this is a case where when you see a news story that's supposed to be straight reporting and they use a whole bunch of adjectives, you know that there's bias involved. So it says, a small vocal group of Florida Key residents. Well, how small? How vocal? Will you give us facts. A small vocal group of Florida Key residents have fought the release of what they call, quote, mutant mosquitoes <laughs> since the project was announced. And of course, they put that in quotes, mutant mosquitoes, to try to make you think, oh, this is outlandish that they would think these were mutant mosquitoes. These are unsophisticated people who don't understand. But as we just read in the NPR article, they are mutant <laughs> mosquitoes. The scientists specifically developed them to mutate. <laughs> that makes them mutant mosquitoes. Anyway, and then we see, you know, they even took out this billboard against it, right? So again, why does this matter? Let's look back at the Nuremberg Code. Number one, the voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely essential. This means that the person involved should have legal capacity to give consent should be so situated as to be able to exercise free power of choice without the intervention of any element of force, fraud, deceit, duress, overreaching, or other ulterior form of constraint or coercion. So when you implement these types of experiments on an entire community and you just release these things that people have not given their consent to have, which it's clear this original uh, article that we read, well, to be clear, they're not planning <laughs> to release these things. They're planning to release them at some point in the future. Two years from now, we'll read an article about how they released them. Um, and the people who they've been released on will have not been able, they will not have been capable of giving their consent to being, you know, attacked by these mosquitoes. So guys, we've been down this road before. There's a reason the Nuremberg Code was developed, and there's a reason why we agreed as a civilization that these were good rules that we should follow in the future. When we go down this road where individual rights can be trampled for the collective good, it does not lead to a good place. Who determines what the collective good is? Well, whoever has power. So whoever exercises raw power can determine what the collective good is. And laws, respect for individual rights, completely goes out the window and the exercise of raw power becomes an end unto itself. All of this paves the way for dictatorship. It paves the way for the Antichrist. That's where we're headed. So this is just an indication that that's where we're headed. When so many people would participate in this, see this as normal, and these aren't the only types of violations of the Nuremberg Code that we see in society today. This cavalier attitude toward, well, sure, yeah, it might violate parts of these principles that we've agreed to, but 
It's for the common good. It's for the good of society. It's for the good of human civilization. And if you say no to it, you're standing in the way of progress. Is that really the road that we want to go down? Is that a price we want to pay? But that's where we're heading. And, you know, we know we live in the season of the Lord's return because Jesus said, when you see all these things happen, you know that I'm right at the door. I'm about to return. And we see the signs that Jesus and the prophets talked about. We see the nation of Israel back in the land. We see the Jewish, Jewish people back in control of Jerusalem. We see the gospel spreading around the world. We see this type of lawlessness. We see so many things happening. So on that note, you know, how can I laugh about this type of stuff? Because I know this type of news is, you know, it see, seems bad on its surface and it is bad. But the reason, the very reason that I can laugh at these types of things is because A, I can see through them, but B, and most important, is I know how it all ends. It ends with Jesus reigning on his throne from Jerusalem. Jesus is coming back, right? And so from now till when Jesus returns, I don't know how long that time frame is, but I know it's not that long because we do live in the season of his return. During that time frame, there's going to be suffering. There's going to be injustice, yes. But I know that it won't be lasting. Jesus is going to come and he will end all injustice. He will end all suffering. Jesus is coming back, guys, and that is the joy and the hope we can have so that we can laugh when we read some of these absurd stories of what's happening in our world. So take heart in that, take joy in that. I don't worry about this stuff. Why? Because my life is built on a firm foundation of Jesus Christ. That's Jesus is who I've built my life on. If you have built your life on the shifting sands of anything else other than Jesus, then when the trials and tribulations of this world, when the storms of this world come, you're going to get run over. You're going to get destroyed. But me, yeah, no matter what they do, any amount of suffering that I will bear in this world pales in comparison to the wonderful things that God has in store because I have built my life on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ. And nobody can take that away. No tyrant, no dictator, nobody. So I can have joy. And if you want that peace that surpasses all understanding, if you want that same peace and you don't have it right now, you can have it. All you have to do is ask Jesus for it. Say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I humble myself. I know that, I, I know that I've wronged you. I know that I have not lived up to your perfect standard but I trust in you. I trust in your death and your resurrection. The blood that you spilled on the cross is forgiveness of my sins. And if you do that, then you will achieve a peace that surpasses all understanding. And all the things that all the crazy things happening in the world today won't bother you at all. So, <laughs> you know, just like genetically modified mosquitoes flying all around you, you won't, it won't worry you at all. So, Guys, what do you think of this? Because <laughs> I think I think this is absolutely crazy. I don't I don't understand why anybody would think that this was a good thing to do, but maybe you think otherwise. So leave your comments below. Make sure to like and share this. And God willing, we'll talk tomorrow. Bye. If you want to learn more about the end times and Bible prophecy, make sure to sign up for my free monthly newsletter and get your copy of my free ebook, Seven Signs of the End Times. Just follow the link in the description to get your free book. Also, make sure to check out all of my books. Just look up Brit Gillette on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Apple iBooks, Google Books, Kobo, or anywhere books are sold. Thanks for watching today, and until next time, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith.